As the sun comes up in the morning And I look to be in the day I reflect on the life that I treasure And the mountains that stand in my way There's so much that I've taken for granted I am trying to be more aware But I've seen quite enough to convince me I can stand up and boldly declare That I'm a believer Isn't nothing gonna keep me down Isn't nothing gonna make me frown For very long Yes, I'm a believer, and when I look above, I can feel His love all around. It surrounds me. One day I know that He'll call me to a home. And I know there will be some confusion But it's Jesus I finally see Cause I'm a believer Isn't nothing gonna keep me down Isn't nothing gonna make me frown For very long, very long Yes, I'm a believer And when I look above, I can feel His love all around. It surrounds me, I'm a believer. And when I look above, I can feel His love all around. It surrounds me. Please stand. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come then for cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is 
Anyone else like to sing with me this morning? <laughs> Front and center, Lana. We've been waiting for this. Well, I had to make a, I had to make a grand entrance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Here we go. You want to sit down? Are you tired of standing up? Sit. Go ahead and sit down. I get a drink of water. You know, Michelle, you need to you need to pass on that mantle of the woohoo. Yeah, yeah, we're leave. gonna miss that. Who, who's gonna do that from now on? I wonder. Yeah. Maybe you should start that up. Man. Okay. You can do it after you sing. Even that would be good. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Come all ye thirsty, come to the way that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of its goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. of hell forever defeated now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so loved God so loved the world praise God praise God from whom all blessings flow Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Sing it with me. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Oh, praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. 
defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of this cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. The whole gospel in a song. You ready, Barry? There's a long black train coming down the line Feeding off the souls that are lost and crying Rails of sin, only evil remains Watch out, brother, for that long black train Look to the heavens, you can look to the sky You can find redemption staring back into your eyes For oh, there is protection and peace the same Burn your ticket for that long black train Here we go, sing with us Cause there's victory in the Lord Lord, cling to the Father and His holy name, and don't go riding on that long black train. There's an engineer on that long black train, he's making you wonder if your ride is worth the pay. Oh, he's just a way for your heart to say, Oh, let me ride, I want to ride that long black train. Cause there's victory in the Lord, I say. Victory in the Lord. Cling to the Father and His hope. for the last song.
Make it count, leave your mind, build a name for yourself. Dream your dream, share your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. But all an empty world can sell our empty dreams. God lost in the lie that it was up to me to make a name the world remembers. But Jesus is the only name to remember. That's right. And I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me only Jesus and I I've only got one life to live I'll let every second point to him only Jesus All the kingdoms built, all the trophies won Will crumble into dust when it's said and done Cause all that really matters Did I live the truth to the ones I love? Was my life the proof that there is only one Whose name will last forever? I, I don't want to leave a legacy I don't care if they remember me Only Jesus And I, I've only got one life to live I'll let every second point to him only Jesus Oh 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 Jesus is the only name Sing it Jesus is the only name Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the only name. My Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember. And I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. Only Jesus. I, I've only got one life to live I'll let every second point in Only Jesus I, I don't want to leave a legacy I don't care if they remember me Only Jesus
like the poem says, only what's done for Christ will last. All this other stuff we got in life, gathering up treasures and, you know, fame and fortune, and et cetera. It's all wood, hay, and stubble when we get to heaven. If you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've accepted him, it, you better be sending up strong material, and that's what's done for Jesus. I praise you, Lord, for the opportunity and the chance and for the healing that you've done in my body. Amen. We strengthen and continue to do, Lord, to do what you have gifted me and appointed me to do, and that is worship you. Yes. And let all the congregation and everybody within the sound of our voice and our music feel your presence father fall on us mightily lord in jesus name amen 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 miss lana well done well done and welcome back we got a little taste on thursday night but today is official for sure so what a blessing what a blessing well good morning and very nice to be here, and you know, what a great song to close with because it is all about Jesus, and that is why we are here this morning. <clears throat> and um, you know, I just, I had a really difficult trip into work or church this morning as we uh, live up a little higher in Bear Valley, and we got some snow last night, and it was snowing this morning. And uh, I have four-wheel drive, and I've come up and down that mountain for 15 years now. And I've had a few close calls when it snows, uh, but this morning was a close call for me. As I was coming down the mountain at about eh, 5.45, 5.50, and uh, just came around one of those familiar turns and in four-wheel drive and low and uh, went to turn the wheel. As you know, on snow and ice, you don't make sharp turns, you take long sweeping turns, and so I took up the two lanes and made my long sweeping turn and still found my truck to not turn and just to keep going kind of straight, and something that I have learned through the years is the last thing you do when you are in a slide on ice or snow is slam on the brake. Even though that is your knee-jerk reaction to slam on that brake because you want to stop, that's the worst thing you can do. And so what did I do? Quickly, instinctively uh, accelerated a little bit, going towards like a berm. On the other side of the berm, of course, is uh, a hill that you don't want to be descending down upon. And uh, so thank God uh, that my tires caught traction. And as I, I'll call it, gently bumped into the berm with my tire that redirected my steering for me, I was able to uh, recapture my traction and safely make it down. But yeah, praise God, because uh, that's, you know, when my wife and I, we moved up there years ago. Um, you know, I told her, I said, man, we lived in the city, you know, Inland Empire, our whole lives. If we're moving up to God's country, man, I want to go out somewhere. I don't want to live in the city. And uh, one of her biggest fears was, you sure you want to go up there? Uh, what about the snow? But uh, anyways, I think, you know, if we just uh, maintain our speed, that's what, you know, we have problems up there a lot because people, California drivers, um, just think a bigger truck, bigger tires, four-wheel drive, I'm invincible, and uh, that's not the case. And so, anyways, I'm blessed to be here this morning and hope you are as well, as uh, we're going to be continuing our study here this morning, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be picking up at verse 7 <clears throat> and working all the way through the rest of the chapter. As last week, Paul talked to us about, through the Word of God, he talked about this concept of freedom. In fact, verse 1 says that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. So he said, therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So we looked at this idea of freedom. 
and what this freedom represents. And part of the fear with people, even you and I here today, of living in this freedom, trusting in Christ Jesus to be our righteousness, is this fear that we can often take that freedom and use that freedom into a license for us to now sin. And so just like in today, in Paul's day, there was that fear. And so this is really the strongest point of the Judaizers, or even in the church today, those who would fall under the camp of legalist, legalism, those who are yoking themselves back under to the law, feeling that in keeping the law, their righteousness is now uh, being equated to keeping of the law and not of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, which we looked at last week. Paul would say, if that's the case, if you're trusting in your righteousness and your keeping of the law for your salvation, you have severed yourself from Christ. You've fallen from, from grace. But here he's speaking to the other side of the coin, the Christians that would be saved by grace through faith in Jesus, but not know what to do with that freedom. I think that that freedom means that it's now all about me, that I don't have to deny any of the desires of my flesh. I'm free to do what I want to do. That is not really what true freedom is. And so the fear is, is that you're going to use this freedom to now serve the flesh. In other words, those people who we all have seen, and maybe we were some of them, who've been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but what we tend to do is we tend to sin, to continually live in a lifestyle of sin. And what do we continually do? We continually come before that throne of grace and we pray and ask God to forgive us and to cleanse us of our sins. And then we go on our merry way and we go right back into that same sin and we go right back before the throne of grace and we go right back into that same sin. And so the legalists or those who say, see, freedom doesn't work. You can't be set free in Christ. We have to yoke ourselves to the law because the law is what keeps us straight and narrow. Not understanding what that freedom is. So the legalist would say, see, that person who continues to sin and ask God for forgiveness is basically praying to a spineless God. They're praying to a spineless God and they cry and they say, I'm so sorry, forgive me. And that spineless God forgives them and they just go on their merry way. So we can't have that. We have to yoke ourselves to this law to ensure that we're doing the right things. Well, here is what Paul is going to get into. If you go back under the law, you're severing yourself from Christ. You've fallen from grace. If you continue in sin then you're not understanding what that freedom is. It's not a license to continue to sin. Christ has set us free so that now we are freely to love and serve one another. That is what we are to do with the freedom of Christ. That is the expression of what it is to be free in Christ, to love and serve one another. So those who are serving themselves through the pleasuring of sin, and I'm talking about practicing sin, habitual sin, a lifestyle of sin, not the sin that you and I can occasionally commit that when we go before God and uh, First um, John 1, 9 says that if we confess those sins before God, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Jesus is our advocate, Colossians tells us. He's there to intercede for us. But what the Bible's speaking of is a life of sin. He's going to give us a few examples of what a life of sin is, what a life of walking in the flesh is, what a life is that is contrary to the freedom that the Bible talks about, to be able to walk in the Spirit and to love and serve one another. So those who are Christians, who are born again, filled with the Spirit, but continuing in sin, are not understanding the freedom in which Christ died to set you free for. It's walking in the Spirit. And this is what Paul is going to guide us through here this morning. So let's pray, and we'll get into the study, picking up here in Galatians 5 at verse 7. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful day. And I thank you, God, for a little break in the weather, Lord. And 
uh, at the same time pray and thank you for the much needed moisture and the snow and the mountains and the lakes are going to be filled once again. And so we thank you for this blessing. Your word says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, the, from the Father in heaven. And so uh, thank you even for the rain, Father. And God, I thank you so much for your word. And I just pray that as we delve into this topic of freedom and what it is to be free in Christ, that you would give us these examples, that you would give us really the roadmap, which I point to Jesus as that roadmap. As Jesus would say, follow me. And even Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. And so show us, Father, what it is to be free in Christ. And help us, Lord, that if we are today even living in sin, habitual sin, where we know we're not right with God, that today would be the day that your spirit would begin to speak to our hearts, that would pierce our hearts. We would, uh, you would bring to our remembrance, you'd bring it to light, the sin that is within us, that we can see the sin, agree with the sin, and then confess the sin and repent of the sin and get back on that road of freedom that you've set us free from, that we don't revert back to bondage and legalism to try to set us free or keep us on the straight and narrow, but we continue to stand firm, as Paul just said, standing firm in the freedom in which you died to set us free for. So bless your church, bless your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. And so Galatians 5 I'm going to begin reading here at verse 7. Bear with my voice. I'm not getting sick. I was at a wrestling competition with my daughter. We left at 3 o'clock in the morning yesterday and got home at midnight. So I'm exhausted and my voice is hoarse because if any of you saw the videos I posted, I was screaming and yelling. <clears throat> Positive reinforcement. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So my voice is a little hoarse and scratchy and sore, but God is good. And, and it actually is something I want to talk about at the end, you know, when we look at the sin of idolatry and, and really painting these pictures of, you know, the Bible says that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things added unto that. So then somebody posed the question, well, is it wrong for my kids to do sports? Is that an idol in their life? And here's my answer. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That other thing that was added unto you, if God was to uproot that in your life, would you turn from following him? Would him uprooting that thing he has added unto you cause you then to leave or deny the very God that you claim to serve and know? Well, if that's the case, then I would say that other thing has become an idol. But now if God takes that other thing from your life and it doesn't affect you and nothing changes in your life, that is because you are seeking first the kingdom of God. So how about your job? <laughs> if God was to take your job from you unexpectedly, would you still love and serve God the same you did today when you have that job and your pockets are full of cash today? Well, if your life is affected by him taking that, then I would say that job has become your idol. And God has a way of sometimes politely asking us to put those other things down, to test us. And if we do, he may say, pick it back up again. And God has other times where we don't want to listen to that. God may just take it away. Remember what Job said? You and his wife even said, look at what God has done to you. How could you love God? Look at he's taken everything away from you. Why don't you just curse God and die? Well, Job knew that all those other things were added unto him. That Christ, that God was sufficient. That's why he would say, though God slay me, I will not deny him. I will love him. Something that nobody else understood. So if you're looking at something in your life and asking yourself, this may be an idol, well, take it away and see what happens. Is your relationship still the same with God? 
or does it change? If it changes, then maybe that thing is an idol in your life. So that's the end of the sermon because that was the end of the notes. So have a blessed day. God bless you. Anyways, let's, uh, let's start here. I'm sorry, verse 7. That was just kind of on the, the cusp, but it was supposed to be at the end. So anyways, Paul says here in verse 7, he says, you were running well. He said, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. He says, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision... Why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Verse 12 says, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. If we have any kids here today, uh, when we get to that verse, that is a very graphic picture. Verse 13 says, For you, brethren, were called to freedom. Brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but... Through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So Paul, again, he said this a couple chapters ago. He goes back and he says, he uses the past tense use of the word here. He says, you were. You were running well. Who hindered you? So in other words, Paul is saying you were running well. You received Christ by the preaching of his word. That word spoke to your heart. You confessed your sin. You invited him into your life. You were born again. You were filled with the spirit. You were running well. He says, but who now has hindered you? Notice it's not Christ who hindered them. He said, who hindered you? A person hindered them from running well. It wasn't Christ. That's what he says. The persuasion did not come from him who calls you. So who hindered you? I think the word hindered here is an interesting word. The word that Paul uses here in the Greek is really speaking of a word. It's, uh, the use is in the military form. It's picturing when an enemy is looking to invade a city. A lot of times what the military will do was they will bomb or they'll shoot down or they'll, they'll send missiles to these roads or bridges to destroy the road and the bridge so that obviously the enemy can't bring their troops or their heavy equipment into the place that they're attacking. And so when he uses the word hindered, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about somebody, you were on the right road, the, the narrow road. But somebody has now blown up that road and made it impassable now. You cannot pass through that road anymore because somebody hindered you from being on that road. This is the use of the word here. And so we have to be aware. We have to be aware that we are standing firm in the truth, that we are standing firm in that freedom, that we continue to run well, that nobody hinders us from this path. You know, the path that God is laying for us, what a contrast. That it's God who's making that path for us, right? He's making it straight. But yet, who has now hindered that path? Who has blown up the way? Well, here's what Paul says about not allowing somebody to hinder you. He says in first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, this was close to being Paul's last words. It's his farewell, his swan song, you may say, before he would be executed. Verse 6 says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I love this, verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. 
In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing. What did Paul say? He says, I have fought. He says, I have finished. You see, it's not so much how we start, guys. How you start doesn't have any bearings on anything unless it's the same way you finish. Right? So many Christians, myself included, when I first got saved, I was on fire for Christ. All I wanted to do was throw off all those shackles, or we call them things, and just serve him and love him and see what God had in store for me. But oftentimes, that fire begins to burn out, maybe because some other Christians in the church are not walking in the spirit and the church looks worse than the world. <laughs> not this church. Or is it this church? And they bite and they devour one another and, and you read the word of God and then you look at your brother and you're like, whoa, isn't he reading the same word I'm reading? Then how come they're not living this word? Whatever your reasons are. And so you let that fire begin to fan out. And that's the danger here. It's not how we start, it's how we finish. We should actually finish, I pray, that we finish better than we started. That we are being molded more and more into the likeness of Christ Jesus. I don't want to look like I did when I was a baby Christian. It was a beautiful thing. Thank God I was saved. But can you imagine a 46-year-old man still nursing? Can you imagine a 40-year-old man still having to have his diapers changed? Now, I know there is a day coming. I warn my kids about it. It's going to be your job. But I'm not talking about those years. I'm talking about a grown man being a baby. That's not what you want, right? We want to grow up into the things of Christ. We want to be more and more like Christ, understanding what the freedom in Christ is. It is to love one another and serve one another. It's not about me anymore. You see, that is actually walking in the flesh, being concerned about little old me. And make sure everyone's on, you know, track with my life. I'm the narcissist. That is walking in the flesh. Walking in the spirit is loving our neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Come on. Who's your neighbor? That's who the Bible is talking about, loving your neighbor. It doesn't say your good, godly Christian friend who also loves you. That would be easy. <laughs> love your neighbor. Well, wait a minute. How do I have to love them? Pretty easy. Love them as you love yourself. How do I love myself? You don't need a 90-minute sermon on how to love yourself, do you? We're all pretty good about loving ourselves. I look at you all here this morning and everyone's hair is done or your head is uh, groomed. You have clothes on. Bathed, hopefully, you took a shower, brushed your teeth, right? Looked in the mirror a few times, made sure you didn't miss a spot. We know how to love ourselves. That little belly was going, Vroom. so what'd you do? Jumped into the fridge and grabbed something to eat. Oh, I need some coffee, 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 right? We know how to love ourselves. Nobody has to teach us that. But we have to be taught how to love one another, don't we? We have to taught to be able to, we have to be taught to deny ourselves. That is something that has to be taught. What does it say about training up a child in the way that they shall go? You don't have to teach a child how to be selfish. You have to teach a child how to share the ball. You ever seen that? I'll never forget that when my kids were little in preschool. I won't mention the preschool. It was a great Christian preschool. That's not the point. The kids was the point. You had these good kids who were little kids, toddlers. And they were all kind of in a circle, you know, and they were just kids having fun until the teacher, because I was dropping Caitlin off 
and the teacher had like this new toy, right? Big mistake to only have one toy, new toy. So she pulls out the new toy, you know, and there's one kid, oh, you know, and then the other kid, oh, and the next thing you know, you have these 10 kids like, ah, give me that toy, give me that toy, right? I'm not condemning the behavior. I'm making a point. You don't have to teach a kid how to be selfish. You have to teach them how to be unselfish, to share. Life is not all about you and I. Boy, some people, it takes them their whole life. Maybe they still haven't figured that out. Life is not about you. You are not the center of the universe. And I can say that boldly because I actually lived that way for a long time. Even in my marriage, I thought the whole point of marriage was for my wife to serve me. To make me happy, not serve me like, get out there and do this and do that. But her job was to satisfy me. How did that work? Not too well. (laughs) Not too well. And to my defense, she probably felt the same way. Because that's what we're taught, right? Love. Oh, when somebody loves me, they're just going to show me all the affection I desire. And they're going to do all these things for me. And they're going to make me feel warm and fuzzy. That's part of love. But there's a deeper part of love. And what it is, is it's not expecting somebody to satisfy me. Because I'm already satisfied in Christ Jesus. I'm already full, so nobody else can fill me anymore. I'm full. Now, I have to look for something to do with my fullness. I want to share this. I want to give this. I want to serve this. That is actually walking in the Spirit. It's serving each other. It's finding more pleasure in serving others. And God is so good that I don't get stolen from when I give everything I have to somebody else. They may take it for granted. They may not even understand the sacrifice that it took me to do, and they just go off and, thanks. That doesn't even matter to me. Because God fills my cup even more. Fills my cup even more. Now, I'm not saying we need to be, you know, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but my point is is it's not going to keep me from giving out of myself because one person hurts me or burns me. I'm not going to let that stop me from walking in the Spirit, from loving my neighbor as I love myself. Because if I do let that happen, what happens then is I give in to the flesh. I now begin to walk in the flesh and not in the Spirit. And we're going to get into it at some point today. You can't do both. You can't walk in the Spirit and walk in the flesh. They are at war against each other. And you say, well, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit living within me. There's no war in there. You bet there is. Just because the old man or old woman has been crucified with Christ, guess what? He still has some little inspiration in our lives, doesn't he? And he will, or she, until the day we get our new, resurrected, glorified bodies. So until that happens, we have this war, even as Christians. And Paul says here, we have a choice. Being saved, we can get into if that's a choice or not. But being saved, you have been set free, he said. If you believe in Jesus, you confess with your mouth, you receive him, you are saved. Therefore, you have been set free. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But now here's Paul's question. What are you doing with the freedom? You have a choice. You can use it to splurge on yourself and be selfish. Or you can take that freedom to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you have been set free, Christian, in Christ. The question is, what are you doing with it? Are you using it as an opportunity for the flesh? Or are you using it to serve God. And so what a beautiful thing here. He says, who has hindered you? You were running so well. Who has hindered you? Who's blew up this road? He said in verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Be careful. Leaven is always a picture of sin in the Bible. It's a picture of evil, actually. Jesus talks about sin and leaven in Luke 12. 
verses 1 through 3, when he's talking to the religious leaders, he says this in verse 1. It says, under these circumstances, after the many thousands of people had gathered together, that they were stepping one on another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known accordingly Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the hilltops. So Jesus here uses the word leaven to describe the Pharisees, and he says it's hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees was trying to get people to be conformed to the law, to live under the law because they lived under the law. They were trying to conform people to, hey, my righteousness comes through me keeping the law even though they were not made righteous through the keeping of the law. This is hypocrisy. We looked at that last week. And so Jesus says, be careful of this leaven. Be careful of this hypocrisy. And we know what leaven does, right? In a lump of dough, it doesn't just stay the same. It begins to permeate throughout that whole lump. It begins to spread. So this kind of thinking, the one who has come in, who has hindered you from the truth, which is not Jesus Christ, has blown up your road, made it impassable. Be careful because just a little bit of that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump, meaning that road pretty soon is going to no longer even be visible. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So then you need to deal with that leaven. You need to deal with that sin. You need to deal with that hypocrisy. Here's what he says in verse 10. Paul says, I have confidence in you, in the Lord that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. Paul says, look, I have confidence in you, in the Lord. What does he mean? Well, when we are in Christ, doesn't God say that he who began the good work, that is he who is faithful to complete it? So Paul is saying, I have confidence that you're not going to adopt any other view because of God, because God's promise to you. That he is faithful. But, he says, the one who is disturbing you will bear the judgment, whoever he is. So, the one who's coming in to hinder this straight and narrow path that God has made a way for us, the one who's come to hinder that path, to blow it up, Paul says that he will bear his judgment no matter who he is. And I think that's important that he says whoever he is. I think we will be surprised on that day as we read the scripture about everything that is hidden will be revealed one day. I think we will be surprised when God begins to reveal the true hearts of people. I think we will. And I think we'll, we will be surprised at what we see. Because some people may look like really, really nice people may be really, really good citizens. But if they are hindering the work of God, if they are blowing up the road, which when I talk about the road, I'm talking about Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It is he who has made us righteous. It is he who died so that he can set us free, and it's this freedom that he died for. Somebody begins to hinder that and blow that road up. Well, guess what? Not only does it spread... But that person will bear the judgment and sometimes it doesn't matter, well not sometimes, all the time, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what your qualifications are. It doesn't matter, matter your status. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are the one hindering this work, blowing up this road, then your judgment, you will bear the judgment. God isn't passive. God is long-suffering and patient in his dealings with mankind. But the Bible tells us and makes it very clear that one day 
the mercy expires, doesn't it? And there's going to be judgment that comes where every person is going to have to finally answer for all those little hidden things. Some of them come visible and some of them remain hidden. But on that day, everything will be exposed. People will be exposed before God. The light will shine and the darkness will have nowhere to flee. And so this is a pretty severe warning to those who I would say adopt these doctrines that diminish the deity of Jesus Christ, that diminish the person of Jesus Christ, as innocent as they think it may be. Paul isn't talking about innocence here. Oops, I made a little innocent mistake. Is he? Bearing the judgment? And so this is why the church has to be very careful. Because I don't want to be, I'm already going to be under a stricter judgment because I'm a teacher. I'm a father. Remember what Jesus said about those who put a stumbling block or, or cause one of these little children to stumble? That it's better for them to do what? Have a millstone hung around their neck and cast into the sea? God takes it pretty serious when we begin to lead people in a different path. This is what he's talking about. The judgment will befall those ones. Don't worry. God's going to take care of those. Is what he's saying here. Verse 11, he says, But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? I love this. Paul's being persecuted because he stopped preaching circumcision. What an amazing thing. They persecuted him because he wasn't preaching that you had to be circumcised. Remember the camp of the Judaizers believed that you had to be circumcised before you could be saved. And if you happened to already be saved somehow, but not circumcised, you had to add to your salvation. You had to become saved again through your circumcision or more saved how's that you had to be a little more saved so Paul in preaching the gospel was persecuted now some may look and say well wait a minute wasn't there a time when Paul actually asked Timothy to be circumcised was he preaching the gospel of circumcision there well let's look at it in the book of Acts chapter 16 because I think it lines up with what we're talking about here today. That Paul was actually looking to use Timothy, whose father was a Greek. He was looking to use Timothy to take with him to begin to preach to the Jews. And so this is why Paul said to Timothy, hey, you need to be circumcised. First, notice that Paul did not tell Timothy he needed to be circumcised for his salvation. Timothy was not circumcised so that he could be saved. Why did Paul ask Timothy to be circumcised? So that Timothy would not be offensive to the Jews who believed in circumcision, so that Timothy would go in and, and they wouldn't immediately put up a wall because of the issue of circumcision. So Paul didn't want to have any barriers or stumbling blocks, which, remember, we're going to read here, loving someone is walking in the Spirit. Doing something for someone, giving up your freedom. He didn't have to be circumcised, but he did it so that he would hopefully have a way. Remember when Paul said, I become all things? to all people with the hopes to win them to Christ. Right? This is what it is. Okay, these guys are obviously hung up on this stuff. They won't even give me the time of day unless I, you know, am circumcised. Then maybe they'll listen. So he was using it as a way to get in to preach the gospel so that people can be saved. There's a difference. He's not doing it to be saved. He's doing it out of love. He's willing to sacrifice, literally, part of his flesh... For someone else to share the gospel. What a powerful, powerful thing. 
So no, Paul didn't preach circumcision. He preached the complete opposite. We've been reading and studying about it. And what does he say then at the end? He says, then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Wow, now you make not circumcision the stumbling block. Now you make the cross the stumbling block. When you start preaching about the cross. And see, what is the preaching of the cross? Well, the preaching of the cross summed up is you can't save yourself. That's what Paul was saying. So your circumcision, you want to go circumcise yourself? In fact, what does he say here? Go castrate yourself. Why stop with just a little bit? Just take it all off. You want to be holy? Be like the pagans, the pagan priests. That's what the pagan priests did. They castrated themselves for their God. So Paul says, why stop at just circumcision? Go all the way. So the greatest offense to legalism is the cross. Because legalism says there's something I have to do. The cross says the opposite. There ain't nothing you're going to do. God's not even asking you to do it. The first step he's asking you to do, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. So the offense of the cross really is legalism, and, and it's people in legalism can't handle the message of the cross because it just speaks of freedom. It speaks of, I can't save myself. God has to save me. And so he says here in verse 12, I wish those who are preaching this message who are blowing up the road of God. He says, I wish that those who troubled you would even mutilate themselves. I already got into enough description with that. Don't just stop with the circumcision. Go all the way. And so legalism, guys, the picture here is that it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. It's a big issue. It's a big deal that permeates. And so what does he say? Well, verse 13, he tells us now how to use our liberty. Because again, those who are afraid of the freedom in Christ, because they're afraid that that freedom, they don't know what the freedom is, is the problem usually. So they're afraid of the freedom. It's easier and safer to yoke myself to the law. Versus those who are using this freedom for the wrong reasons. And so Paul tells us what exactly this freedom that he's talking about in Christ is. It's not a license to sin. Verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. And so Christians, again, our lives are marked by freedom. It's what he said in verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. But he says very clearly here, brethren, which by the way, brethren is speaking of those who have received Jesus Christ by grace through faith. So he's talking to born-again Christians here, people who are already free in Christ Jesus. He says, you Christians, not the ones out there still blind to sin and living and reveling in sin. He's talking to Christians. He says, you brethren, don't take this freedom and turn it into an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use this liberty to serve the flesh. And so I love here the question, how will we then use this liberty and not turn it into a use of the flesh? Well, when he says do not, it first has to be understood that you have a choice. We choose. We choose what we do with the freedom that Christ has given us. He gave it to us if we receive it. But now what do we do with it? Well, we can spin our freedom and use it to please ourselves. And oftentimes when I use that freedom and spin it to please myself, it's at the expense of others, isn't it? It's at the expense of others. 
And so freedom and liberty is not a right to sin. In fact, that freedom told us that we were free from sin. We are free from condemnation. We're now free from having to try to earn our salvation through our own good merits. And so really the freedom that Paul is speaking of here when he says love each other and serve each other, he's saying that this spirit is a desire that has been given to us. It's an ability now that has been given to us on how we are going to walk before him. How are we going to serve him through love? You see, the antidote for using freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, pleasing myself, the antidote really is given here. It's to love someone and to serve them. That's the antidote. And so the flesh really expects others to conform to us. And it doesn't care much at all for others. That's the flesh. That's the nature of the flesh. It's all about me, myself, and I. You're either with me or you're against me. You need to conform to my ways. That's the flesh. You see, serving one another is the complete opposite. It's not about me all of a sudden. It's about you. Serving one another in the spirit is the spirit. And really, it's how we conquer the flesh. You're struggling with the flesh? Stop. Here's what I tell people sometimes when they come to me, and, and, and I have struggles, difficulties too. I'm not trying to downplay this, but here's maybe a little insight somebody needs to hear today. It, it spoke to me in volumes. It was something that has been spoken to me that I repeat. Is that okay? Isn't that a beautiful thing as Christians that we don't have to come up with our own little things? God gave us all the words. We just have to be little parrots and repeat it, right? It's awesome. But sometimes people get too inside of their own heads, if you spend too much time in your own head, you're going to go crazy. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be miserable. And so sometimes what I'll tell people, if you're sitting there stewing on you, 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 all these bad things, you, 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 you know what you need to do? Go outside of yourself. Get your attention and your focus off of yourself and put it on someone else. And guess what? You're going to be free. You're going to be free. But no, the flesh likes to sit there on the little hamster wheel. You see, how we conquer the flesh is through serving and loving other people. It's no coincidence that God put that as the first commandment, Jesus. Remember, he summed up the whole law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. How fascinating that in doing that, I'm serving God, and what else am I doing? Fulfilling the whole law. All those legalists that are trying to keep the law, guess what? I can fulfill the law. By what? Loving God and loving my neighbor. I fulfill the law in Christ. And physically, I work it out by loving my neighbor. What a beautiful thing. You see, the spirit in loving and serving others conquers the flesh that just wants me, that's very selfish, and boy, doesn't that flesh have an appetite. The flesh doesn't know when to say stop. The flesh only says more, more, more. And it never satisfies. Just a little bit more. Isn't that what Warren Buffett said? One of the, back in the days, one of the richest men in the world when asked, you know, you got how many billions and billions and trillions of dollars? Warren, you know, when is it going to be enough? And what did he say? One more dollar, right? It's never going to satisfy. It's always beyond you. And so verse 14, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That really is lived out through service. That's how we love each other. We serve each other. It's an attitude of service. And in this attitude of service, we fulfill the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us. We actually are not under the law. We are fulfilling the law. 
when we love God and love our neighbor. And so, really, what does the flesh produce? It produces strife. It keeps us now when we serve each other. Doesn't that have a way of keeping us from strife? Put two very selfish people in a room together and see what happens. Now put two people who serve each other in the same room and see what happens. Put a whole church of selfish people together and see what happens. Put a church of people who love to serve each other together and see what happens. You see... Loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and serving them destroys strife. Because it's no longer about me. We're not fighting for the cleaning crew position on the church. Which, by the way, nobody's doing. Which, a plug for Brent, we could use more help on the cleaning crew. I'm not trying to make anyone feel compelled. But how funny that we can often strive for the positions that are a little more visible than the ones that are not visible. Could there be a little strife involved there? You bet. But how do we counteract strife? How do we conquer strife and flesh? By loving God and loving our neighbor and serving each other. Dying to ourselves. It's not all about me. Trust me, if Gerald wasn't the pastor here tomorrow... God surely has a man more capable than me to fill this spot. The world doesn't stop the minute that I stop preaching the gospel. And same with you. You know, it's so sad when people pass away. And maybe they're in the forefront of the news and, you know, the, when the funeral's going on and But how quickly after time, not the loved ones, of course, they will continue to grieve for a long time, but how quickly we find that life just goes on. Sometimes we don't want it to, but it still rolls on, right? Don't forget that. Your kids' lives are going to be just fine even when you're gone. It's going to go on. Hopefully it goes on good. If you've laid a good foundation of Christ and taught him good things, then that life will probably go on for the better. But life will go on. It's not all about you and I. And I think today we live in a society that it's all about me as an individual, my rights, my freedoms. What about that lady that I still talk about that was probably 10 years ago because it was one of the first cases, right? Everyone's so happy. You offend me, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to find a reason to sue you because you did wrong to me and you're going to pay for it. The lady that went through McDonald's years ago and ordered a cup of coffee, right, and somehow spilled it on her lap and burned herself and sued McDonald's and they ended up settling for like millions of dollars. Because of your clumsiness? Really? But see, it's all about me. You ruined my pants. You burned me. You hurt me. Whatever happened, to, it was an accident. Now, if the guy, like, opened up the thing and threw a pot of coffee on him, hey, that's a different thing, right? <laughs> right? Even if he just kind of clumsily, I mean, come on. But you see, when you offend me, you hurt me. Oh, man, the flesh is nasty. That's why he says, beware, if you're walking in the flesh, guess what? You're going to devour each other. The picture is a pack of wild animals. Picture that. A pack of wild animals just... You're an animal. Your primal instincts to survive. Right? That's animalistic. The Bible says that The freedom that God has given us is loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, not devouring our neighbors, not walking in the flesh, serving our neighbors. What an amazing thing. So we don't have to keep the law. We actually fulfill the law when we love our neighbor and serve 
our neighbors. And so who is the neighbor? I already answered that question. Your neighbor is your neighbor. How do we love them? The same way we love ourselves. We don't need a book to tell us how to do that. So verse 16, here it is. I say to you, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's not speaking of the thousand-year reign. That's speaking of heaven. Will not inherit the kingdom of God, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, some people get confused here, but the next expressions here are speaking of love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. And how is love shown? Well, through joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So he says here, walk in the Spirit. Because you can't walk in the Spirit and the flesh at the same time. If you walk in the Spirit, then you won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, then guess what? You're not going to satisfy the desires of the Spirit. And so what does he mean, walk in the Spirit? Well, first we know that we have to have the Spirit in our lives. We have to be born again, is what Jesus said. So the Spirit has to live within you before you can walk in the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit living within you. And then when the Spirit is living within you, He is doing what? He's making you more sensitive to the influence now of Himself in your life. The Holy Spirit begins to make you more sensitive to the things of the Spirit. And what was the Spirit's primary focus to do for a believer? We know that the Holy Spirit came into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But then once we receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us and the Holy Spirit begins to testify of who? Jesus. So the Holy Spirit now living in me is now influencing my life to live the life that Jesus lived. To be conformed more into the image and likeness of Jesus. That's what walking in the Spirit is. It's walking in in the same path, the same ways that Jesus did, and it's much more than that. It's becoming more like Christ. Didn't Jeremiah the prophet say that? That God has now written his law in our minds and on our hearts? It's the Holy Spirit now who's influencing us in the ways that we shall go. And what does it look like? Pretty simple. It's Jesus. It looks just like Jesus. He Looks just like Jesus. In fact, if you turn to John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you the helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. So the Holy Spirit is in us, and it is He who is now influencing us to walk a life after Christ. John 14, 26. Look at all these verses right here in John 14, 15, and 16 that speak of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will do what? Will bring to remembrance all the things that who said? 
Jesus. So the one who is living within me is now influencing me into the things that Jesus taught, the ways that Jesus would go. John 15, 26, speaking of the Holy Spirit, says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. So what is walking in the Spirit? It's a cliche thing we like to say. What does it really look like? Well, here it is. He's teaching us about the things that Jesus taught us. He's leading us in the ways that Jesus would go. He's pointing us to Jesus. He's testifying that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world. How about John 16? Verse 13 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Interesting. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and I will disclose it to you. What a beautiful thing. This is what walking in the Spirit is. And so if we walk in the Spirit, we're not going to satisfy the lust of the flesh. These two are opposites, guys, and it's a battle. I said that. We have been set free in Christ, but what are we doing with that freedom? Are we using it as an opportunity for ourselves? Or are we walking in the Spirit, which is the picture of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, being inspired in our inner man to do what? To follow Jesus, to be more like Jesus? Well, you see, the flesh here, when he says they're at war and one's going to increase and the other's going to decrease... Romans 6, 16, Paul says this. He's talking about dying to the old man. That we have become new creations in Christ. But just because we've died to that old man, as I said, doesn't mean that his influence isn't still there. This is the battle that we still face as saved, born-again Christians. The flesh. Each and every day, we choose we choose, and the one we choose is what we're feeding and we're going to become more of, and the other one's going to starve. Whichever one we feed gets stronger, whichever one we deny gets weaker and dies. And so what does he say here in verse 18? If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law for obvious reasons. Because if you're led by the Spirit, you are doing what? Loving your neighbor as you love yourself, which is the commandment that Jesus said. If you keep this commandment, you fulfill the whole law. How amazing that that is why we're not under the law when we are led by the Spirit because we are loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. So now, quickly, let's look at these evidences of walking in the flesh. Aren't you glad that the Bible laid out a few things for us to picture where we're at? And so it's real easy as we read through this list, which category are we in? If you fit in one category or the other, then guess what? That is what you are walking after. You're either walking after the flesh or you're walking after the spirit. You're not doing both. It's one or the other. And so the first list he gives us is of the flesh. He says in verse 19, these deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, and sensuality. The first three here are referencing sexual behavior, conduct. Immorality, impurity. Really, he's speaking here of fornication. Some Bibles may say fornication, which is porneia, or the picture is the use of a prostitute. These are deeds of the flesh. And these sexual sins were just as powerful in the days of Paul as they are today. Yes, this generation is way wacky and immoral and perverse, but let's not deceive ourselves. The things in Paul's day were just as bad, if not worse, these Roman baths 
Oh, you bet there was homosexuality. You bet there was bestiality. You bet there was child pedophilia. It's no new sin. We just are able to hear more about it all over the world because of our little devices. There's nothing new under the sun. I'm not downplaying it. I'm saying it's always been a big problem. Sexual sin. Fornication. What is fornication? Isn't sex good? Didn't God give sex to man and woman? In the confines and covenant of marriage. That the man and woman can now come together and be joined together as one flesh. Under the covenant of marriage, fornication would be anyone who is not married, who is engaging in sexual activities. And just in case we're questioning if that only means, no kids in here, right? If that only means intercourse, yes, the Bible touches on things that makes us feel a little weird sometimes. That is what impurity is speaking of. Consensual non-intercourse sexual actions. Sensuality, what is that speaking of? Pfft, I'm ready for it anytime, every time, all the time. Picture the panting dog who's just running around. The Bible even says six things God hates. Guess what one of them are? Feet that run quickly to evil. Waking up in the morning and going to bed at night with nothing but sexual fornication, impurities, all of these things racing and driving through your life. The Bible says those are deeds of the flesh. And if that is you, guess what? All you need to do is confess those sins to God. Ask Him for your help and for Him to set you free from the deeds of those flesh and to set you free to now love and serve God. Him. See, God replaces those desires with something that is pure. That thing that you're craving for, that you never seem to have satisfied, that leaves you empty, well, guess what? When you give it to God, God replaces that with what you're looking for. He will satisfy you beyond what any man, woman, or anything else sexually will please you in. In fact, I'll say this. I hope I don't blush or make you blush. But intimacy between a man and a woman in a marriage is a lot more enjoyable and fulfilling when my relationship with my wife is not only dependent on that intimacy. In other words, when I love God first, God is able to satisfy me in that which I'm looking to be satisfied maybe through my wife or my husband intimately. But then when I have the right order, that intimacy with my spouse becomes even greater. What an amazing God we serve. That's why we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added Unto you. What a beautiful thing. The next list he says here, verse 20, uh, or 19, uh, the deeds of flesh, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, and sorcery. Now, this very clearly speaks to false religions. This speaks to witchcraft. Um, sorcery speaks of witchcraft or the service into witchcraft, the dark arts, the occults, people who are into drugs, mind-altering drugs, hallucinogenics. That was the group that I fit into in high school, using mushrooms and LSD to try to expand my mind and try to figure out what's out there and what's going on. And all you're doing is opening portals to demonic things you may think it's fun and cool at time and doing space travel and all this stuff in your mind but i'll get a rude awakening to you if you're so blessed god will pull the uh, the blinds back on that lie and shine the light and what you will find is it is the darkest deepest deception there is the devil doesn't care where he's taking you on what little fantasy trip as long as he's taking you on it he's happy because you're not on that little short narrow path of freedom in christ jesus so we have to be careful because even drugs, those are portals into demonic things. And if you don't think demonic things are real, 
<laughs> They're very real. In fact, I said it before, this is probably where we have to close. But uh, that's actually where I, f I always had an understanding that there was a God because my parents. But I didn't quite understand that this God was like personal. I just thought, okay, he's spying on me, you know, and, you know, making sure I've been naughty or nice, you know, kind of like the Santa Claus figure. That was my picture of God. And so I was a free child. I was born in the wrong generation, probably should have been born in the 60s. Liked the music, liked all of it, but liked the drugs too. Liked the sex and all the whole thing that came with the 60s. Free, you know, being free, brother. And so I went on these weird tangents and paths and all kind of, whatever kind of drug you had, let me have it. Just wanted to get high. Was just looking for the next new experience. That's what my life was all about from 18 to probably 25. Somehow maintaining a job through those times. But I'll never forget, I thought that going out into the desert with some buddies and eating mushrooms and, you know, dropping hits of acid and getting loaded and, you know, was just so cool. And it was just amazing. Until this one time, some of us call it a bad trip. But I say that that was God. Because all of a sudden, I was so terrified. Every other time I'd done these drugs, it was, it was new, it was fresh, it was exciting, it was cool. Can't wait to do it again. Until this last time, when it wasn't so cool and fresh and fun. I became terrified. There's something about the darkness when you begin to tiptoe into it that becomes very, very surreal. And it was the fear of the absence of anything that I knew was good that scared me to death. Thinking that I was going to be now stuck in this condition. Am I going to ever come out of this? Is this the new life that I now have? Uh oh, did I go too far? And I remember at that point in my buddy's house, <laughs> his parents' house, I cried out and I said, God, and I didn't know God. He wasn't that relational God to me. He was just the guy who was spying on me. But I cried out and I said, God, if you were real, which I'm leaning towards now, you are because... If there's something this dark and evil, there surely has to be something good. And I'm reaching out to that something good. I'd like to tell you that there was some miraculous thing that happened, but there wasn't. But I didn't stay in that trip. I got sober again, and guess what? I never did those drugs again. It took a long time for God to eventually get me to where I was walking on solid ground and, and being a Christian and this and that. But God used that in my life during those times to show me that it ain't all what it's cracked up to be. It's not fun and games, Gerald. It's darkness, it's wickedness, it's evil. That is the place I believe what I saw was a taste of what non-believers are going to experience or those who are after a fornic... Um, well, all of these sins, but preferably sorcery, witchcraft. There used to be this girl in high school that thought it was fun that she knew how to cast spells. She had like a little cookbook that had these little spell books. And she thought, watch, I'll get this guy to have sex with me, you know, and she'll do this crazy. I wasn't doing that stuff, but we knew who she was and she'd do all this stuff. Sometimes, guess what? She'd get the guy. Was there really power there or not? Well, I don't know. There is darkness and there is power there. But you think that the devil's going to give you a little bit of power, which he may do to those witches or those guys that are into sorcery. He may give you a little bit of power, but it's to serve his purposes. Because when he's done with you, guess what? He don't care about you. He's going to throw you or you're going to be thrown into the same place he is. Place of torment and torture. And so the Bible says, guys, this is all, these are deeds of the flesh. The spirit and the flesh are at war. 
And so if we're messing around, I remember my parents used to, I'll never forget, they got furious with me because I came home from like my second or third ever sleepover, you know? It was like a big deal, which our kids it is too. I want to know who you're, you know, bringing into our house and who you're going over to their house. But I lied to my parents and told them we were going to be doing certain things and we weren't, but I needed to go over there and do that stuff. So what did we do? We played with the Ouija board. It's all just fun and games, right? And I even came home telling my mom and dad about it. Oh, yeah, I play this. My dad was like, what? A Ouija board? Those are all portals, but they're, they're enticing, right? Especially to those who are, you know, wanting to be influenced by the Spirit. Wait a minute. The Spirit of God is going to do what? If it is the Spirit of God, is going to testify of Jesus is going to point you into the path of Jesus. So if you're questioning, is this the Spirit of God that's asking me to go out there and kill 50 million people or do all these drugs and all this stuff? It's pretty easy. It's not the Spirit of God. Why? Because we're talking about it. The Spirit of God is going to do what? Testify of Christ Jesus. Set you free from the darkness and from the lies and from the power of sin. Maybe there's somebody here today who needs to be set free from that. Sexual sin is a very dark sin. There's no other sin that a man or woman that can commit. Defiling of the temple of God. Our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does Belial and God have in common? Nothing. Nothing. The power of the Spirit is stronger than the power of darkness. It's stronger than the power of the flesh. And so maybe there's an idol that's crept up into somebody's life. Well, as I said at the onset, because I'm proud of my daughter. She didn't win, but she gave it her all. She's been practicing two, three days a week. She's been training her body, which also is conditioning her mind. There's so many valuable lessons in sports. There's a lot of bad ones too. I'll be fair. It teaches you discipline, teaches you teamwork. It's not all about you. It's a team. It teaches you how to win and lose. Some people just are not good losers. Losing is important because you have to learn to deal with defeat and do what? Get back up and try it again. And she has goals and dreams and aspirations and every day on the way home from practice because dad wants to know what's going on in that wrestling room. So dad joined the wrestling coaching staff to spy on my daughter. <laughs> I love my daughter. I love watching her and I love being with her. And our rides home are the most priceless because it's engaging. She even says it. This is like our counseling time. Why do these always turn into counseling sessions? <laughs> but it's reinforcing the things in school, in wrestling, in her little relationship with her friend that's a boy. And reinforcing it under that umbrella of God. That God is first. And here's how all these other things connect. But let's make sure that we don't get these things out of order. Right? Don't make it a God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added. So it's okay to have other things added unto you. Don't add to your gods like we talked about Thursday night. That doesn't mean have multiple gods. Just make sure God's at the front of the line. No, that means have one God, one passion, one desire. And that needs to be first. And then these other things, here's how you make sure they're not other gods in your life or idols is let God take them away. Or you maybe lay it down, sacrifice it. Say, God, I think today you kind of spoke to me about this. You know what? I'm going to lay it down just because your relationship and my relationship is much more important than this thing. 
and see what God will do because that is a way to test you. And if your life changes drastically because you set it down, then guess what? It's probably because it wasn't meant for you. You know, to be able to live that way. That's how you know if you're getting other idols in your life or not. Are you able to say, freely come, freely go? Here today, gone tomorrow? Do you touch very lightly on all the things that have been added unto you? Then that means you're seeking first the kingdom of God. I can do with it, I can do without it. What did Paul say? It's all about contentment. I have found my contentment in Christ. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. I know what it's like to have everything Paul said, not me. And he said, I also know what it's like to have nothing. But finding the contentment is where the peace and the joy is. What is the contentment? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When God is the most important, then the other things are either additions, blessings, Or sometimes they can even be things that test us, don't they? God does. He does things like that. Not because he needs to know what's going on inside. So that we can know. So that our heart can be revealed to us. But anyways, I pray if that's you here today because the deeds of the flesh are powerful, they're strong, but they are not invincible. Jesus Christ can set us free. He has set us free if you're a Christian. We just have to choose to walk now in the spirit, not in the flesh. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word today. And Lord, thank you for these. God, I just, I pray. I almost know each and every one of them individually. Lord, spend time outside of church with them. And so, God, I pray, Lord, you know what we're all going through, myself included. Lord, that you would reveal something to us today, each and every one of us in our lives. That you would speak to us, Lord, in a special way. Maybe that you would even challenge us. Because I, I pray oftentimes I... I want to decrease and I want to have Christ increase in me and I want to be more like Jesus, but there may be these little hindrances that keep me from actually doing that. And so, Father, I pray you'd reveal those things in each of our lives because I believe we're here because we do want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so, Father, do your work in each and every one of us. And thank you so much in advance for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. May it be our heart's desire to be filled with your spirit, to walk in your spirit, to be influenced by your spirit, to live a life of godliness, to live the life that Jesus pointed us to live. And so, Father, work in us. Go with us now, I pray. Empower us. And I do pray for anyone who's struggling, Father, that they would be touched here today. The gospel message has been declared. And so I pray now, if anyone has heard the knock, that they would open the door and you will come in and sup with them. Father, you came to set free the captives, so do your work here today, I pray. We love you and we bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please stand.
Deliver us from 